Welcome to the Foresight Health Roundup Podcast, Foresight Health's podcast series for healthcare revolutionaries. Outcomes matter, customers count, and value rules. Hello again, everyone. This is Dave Burdett, news editor at Foresight Health. It is Thursday, February 16th. I'm still off my game from the murders at Michigan State on Monday night. That hit close to home with two kids in college. Our inability to protect our kids from school violence is a national disgrace. If you're in healthcare and you're wearing one of those assault rifle pins, you're part of the problem. You should be ashamed of yourself. We're going to talk about another national disgrace on today's show, albeit not on the same level as school shootings, and that's food and nutrition. Or more accurately, the lack of it on one hand and too much of it on the other. Specifically, we're going to talk about the FDA's plan to create what it's calling a unified human foods program and whether health insurers should cover all these new weight loss wonder drugs hitting the market. To tell us what both mean for health and health care are Dave Johnson, founder and CEO of Foresight Health, and Julie Merchantson, partner at Transformation Capital. Hi, Dave. Hi, Julie. How are you guys doing this morning? Dave? I know the groundhog did not predict an early spring this year, but I also know that pitchers and catchers reported for spring training this week. Baseball, better weather, and longer days are just around the corner. That warms my heart on this cold February day here in Chicago when we're expecting a lot of snow tonight and the shoveling that comes with it. Uh, I hear you. Yeah, looking for the silver lining there. Good job. Julie, how are you? Well, the Super Bowl in a place like Seattle means the end of, you know, forever darkness. And we have had a beautiful stretch of weather. So I'm quite happy. And so is everybody here. Good, good. Yeah, not much uh, sports on TV right now, unless you like bowling. So, yeah, (laughs) spring can't come soon enough. Thanks, Julie. uh, Tough to watch. (laughs) It is. Tell that to all the hockey and basketball fans, Dave. You've just lost half our audience. Well, you're probably right. But the Bulls lost a 24-point lead last night. And I think the Hawks lost their, I don't know how many in a row. So uh, It's good we have a nationwide audience because the (laughs) the Chicago (laughs) teams suck right now. That's right. There's not much to watch here. Now, before we talk about the FDA and weight loss drugs, I wanted to ask you about your diet, specifically your Super Bowl diet. Dave, you trashed buffalo chicken wings a few weeks ago. I assume you didn't have any last Sunday. What was your healthy alternative? You know, I almost hate to admit this, but I combined the guilty pleasure of watching football with a slow jog on my treadmill. So I actually lost calories by exercising during the Super Bowl rather than gaining them by eating junk food. (laughs) <laughs> there you go. Wow. You might be the only one in America, Dave. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> a unicorn. <laughs> the unicorn, right. Julie, did you consume any foods without any nutritional value last Sunday or did you uh, stay on the straight and narrow? Well, you don't really want to talk to me about this because I am all about my food health right now, but I made my annual big vat of chili, which is fabulous. My family loaded it up with Fritos. I kept out the beans and just ate the meat part for me. So super healthy. But I did force everyone to try my new buffalo cauliflower bites in the air fryer. And I got to tell you, as many people around the country know, they are delish. Wow. All right. I'm going to have to try that. Now, on the chili, do you put the Fritos in the chili then? Is that what they do? It's a topper, but my family... (laughs) <laughs> just to really have a little bit of chili with their Fritos instead of Fritos on their chili. <laughs> so, you know, to each his own. Good for them. I think we hit all four food groups, candy, candy canes, candy corn, and syrup. So there you go. <laughs> I, I don't think we'll see those in the FDA's Unified Human Foods Program. Under the program, the FDA would combine three FDA offices, the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition, the Office of Food Policy and Response, and part of the Office of Regulatory Affairs, all under one deputy commissioner for human foods. So everything food-related under the FDA works together. The FDA also wants to create a new center, the Center for Excellence in Nutrition. The goal of the new center is to reduce diet-related chronic diseases. That's good. Dave, do you support what the FDA is trying to do? What's the potential for improving population health? And do you think the current health care system will go along with the plan? Who knew? Food is medicine. Unbelievable. 
All kidding aside, integrating and coordinating the activities related not only to food safety, but also to nutritional value is long overdue. There is so much misinformation related to what constitutes healthy eating. It would be of enormous value to the country and the American people if there were a definitive source on what constitutes a healthy diet. It could become a powerful force in combating the spread of chronic diseases. Imagine if processed chicken wings came with a cigarette-like warning label. Sorry, Dave, but they probably should. <laughs> of course, there's a food industrial complex, just like there's a healthcare industrial complex that actively works for its own benefit at the expense of greater society. I worry more about that group here, Dave, than the healthcare industrial complex. There are so many examples of the food industrial complex's nefarious activities, but I'll highlight just one. The book, The China Study by T. Colin Campbell, makes a compelling case that a plant-based diet increases human well-being and longevity. So compelling that Bill Clinton, after he read the book, used it to lose weight and reduce his risk of further heart disease. Clinton being Clinton handed out copies of the book at Chelsea's wedding. After that, the meat and dairy industry went into full attack mode to discredit Campbell's findings. If you want to waste an afternoon, go online and compare all the competing claims, positive and negative, about the China study and plant-based diets in general. What's the truth? Wouldn't it be something if the FDA's new Center for Excellence in Nutrition could clarify how Americans should think about consumption of animal products without undue influence from the food industry? Will that happen? I doubt it. Another thing I worry about is cross-agency coordination between the FDA and the Department of Agriculture on both food safety and nutrition. When I was a graduate student, I did a nationwide job satisfaction survey of all things meat and poultry inspectors as an intern for the Food Safety Inspection Service. As a student, I could do such a study, whereas the agency couldn't do it on its own because of its union labor agreement. After my field work, by the way, I vowed never to eat a boneless ham. I saw how they got made, people. Don't do it. As my experience illustrates, though, the Department of Agriculture is as heavily invested in food safety and nutrition as the FDA. They create the ever-changing food pyramid and manage subsidies for food production. This new FDA initiative aims to spirit some longstanding Department of Agriculture turf at some point, I wonder if we'll need a food czar to force interagency cooperation on this vital topic. Bottom line, I applaud Commissioner Califf's initiatives to better coordinate the government's efforts on promoting better food safety and nutrition. Saying it and doing it are very different things. Let's keep an eye on how these new programs unfold within the government, as well as how the food industry responds to them. Food is medicine. The FDA is saying loud and clear, we should treat our consumption of food as carefully as we do our consumption of medicines. They're right for the good of the American people. Let's hope that happens. Got it, Dave. I have so many questions for you, but I'll just stick with one quick one. The ham you're talking about is the processed ham that comes in a can that you used to use that little key to open? Exactly. Oh. All, right. <laughs> All kinds of animal products get smashed together in a big turban and then pressure forced into the can to give it its final shape, oh, with, oh, along man. with a little gelatin. Pretty gross stuff. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to have to talk to my mom about that. That was a staple in our house growing up. All right. <laughs> 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 Water under the bridge, Dave. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're still here, knock on wood. All right, Julie, any questions for Dave? So, Dave, you know, when I see things like this, that someone like Caleb gets so excited about, it makes me realize how much the government does and doesn't do or how they communicate things that are confusing to people. And, you know, we have futurists estimating that we're going to run out of food for the planet in 2050 and innovators who are desperately trying to create like new, basically fake sustainable food sources. And then you have the federal government continuing, and this is, I think, the Department of Agriculture, you know, paying farmers to not grow certain crops because of some totally outdated set of price controls around the globe. And this announcement just seems tone deaf to some of these bigger issues. But what's the FDA's scope? Are you as confused as I am? Well, those are interesting questions regarding the world running out of food. I'd take that one with a grain of salt, literally. Thomas Malthus made the same prediction in the late 1700s, observing that population growth was exponential, 
while the growth in food production was linear. He was wrong on both accounts to the point where his name has become synonymous with misguided forecasts. So anything that's got Malthusian on it, read it with some caution. Also, the grains we feed cattle, pigs, and poultry in just the U.S. to fatten them up for slaughter is more than enough to feed the entire rest of the world. If push came to shove, we could redistribute food resources to feed more people. That would have the ancillary benefit of improving worldwide health. Answering the FDA scope question is more nuanced and gets into the potential interagency turf wars with the Department of Agriculture that I was talking about a minute ago. The DOA, Department of Agriculture, is the agency that oversees subsidy payments to farmers to both grow and not grow food. You're right, Julie, their programs are hopelessly outdated and supported by strong industry coalitions. So the government subsidizes farmers to grow sugar, corn, think fructose, and dairy production that contributes significantly to our national battle with obesity and chronic disease. The FDA is now stepping into this breach and claiming broader jurisdiction for food safety and nutrition. That's not going to sit well with farmers and major segments of the food industry, probably also not going to sit well with the Department of Agriculture. So although I was being facetious just a moment ago, I actually do wonder if the nation needs a food czar to coordinate rational policies for advancing health and well-being. Our current system clearly isn't doing that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Thanks, Dave. Now let's talk about this boom in the weight loss market. We're talking about two things, prescription drugs like Ozempic and Wagovi and over-the-counter supplements and digital health apps that combine drugs and supplements with coaching. The cost of a prescription drug alone can run more than $1,000 per month. According to a number of stories I've read, many commercial health insurers don't cover the drugs, and Medicare doesn't cover the drugs either. Julie, clinical research has shown that the drugs work when used properly and taken consistently over time. We know the long-term health benefits of weight loss. Should insurers cover them? If so, at what level? And what are the population health consequences if insurers don't cover them? Well, this reminds me of the three-headed monster I know I've talked about here before, which is who's going to win this battle? Is it the innovation that we digitize from the inside of healthcare's bowels to automate our way out of this mess? Or is it innovating upstream by convincing consumers to eat better and exercise? Or is it pharma who produces a curative drug that just is the easy button that you know takes us all away. And this is that classic argument. So here we have a quote unquote curative drug. When you look at the stats, 70% of Americans overweight or obese with increased risk of type two diabetes, heart disease, all the things we know, and the access issues for anything these days, you know, according to the CDC, non-Hispanic black adults have the highest rates of obesity followed by Hispanic black adults. And these are two populations that probably will not have access to a drug like this that cost, Dave, some articles I read were over $1,000 a month. So, you know, there's need here and there are immediate issues. And these two drugs, Ozambic and Wigovi, they're basically the same drug coming from some semalgotide or something, semalglutide. And they're approved for different things, diabetes and obesity, respectively. And they're basically appetite suppressants that really control blood sugar levels and the release of insulin. You know, Wagovi in particular is approved for people with BMI of at least 27 and who have a weight-related condition like high blood pressure or high cholesterol. So studies so far have shown that Wagovi can cut body weight by 15%. It sounds like quite a miracle. But as you pointed out, Berta, these drugs are not covered by CMS or insurers. But you know what is? Bariatric surgery. (laughs) So here we have the setup of insurers will pay for a risky surgical service that takes, you know, tremendous prep and recovery versus now this drug that's coming to market. So setting ourselves up here. But get this. In 2019, there were 230 prescriptions written for Ozempic and another like drug called Moonjaro. In 2022, that number was 5 million. So the market's going crazy. And here are my pros and cons for insurers. 
If health plans covered these drugs, they would be heroes. It would put their brand on the map immediately. I mean, think of the happiness if you as a member could get this drug for free or cheaper and you lost a ton of weight. You'd, you know, you would have all the benefits of feeling better and everything that goes along with weight loss and you'd love your health, your health plan. It'd be amazing. And health plans would likely improve their margins over time as fewer members would need to seek high cost care due to obesity related issues. I do bet the ROI on this for a long term member is there, but the cons are the age old issues. Members churn out of health plans. So the ROI isn't there for any given health plan necessarily. It's very short term thinking in general. And here's the catch this drug works beautifully while people take it properly, but they're lifetime drugs. So once you go on it, you're on it pretty much for life. And compliance is critical because if you don't take it the way you're supposed to, you gain the weight back and more. And people who've taken this have seen that. So, you know, a lot of populations that would need this drug may or may not have uh, strong compliance, but I bet you if health plans wrap super generous support structures around those populations for compliance, they would still save money downstream. So what I'd like to see us personally hammer away at the upstream, you know, consumer nutrition and exercise plan, I think we're at the point where society might need these, you know, easy button solutions. Yeah, patient education is key. And I also want to thank you for working the word bowels into your answer on this topic. <laughs> Yeah, I, I caught You're that. Welcome. Very, very good. Thanks, Julie. <laughs> uh, Dave, any questions for Julie? I'd like to ask you about what we typically call side effects. Drugs have a systematic impact on the body. They target one disease or symptom, but in actuality can influence uh, more than one targeted area. My favorite example of this are the drugs that doctors prescribe for restless leg syndrome. Requip and Mirapex also trigger pathological gambling, compulsive shopping, and hypersexuality in some people who take the drugs. These aren't side effects. These are real effects. So when it comes to diet drugs, there's a long history of these types of inadvertent side effects. So costs aside for a moment, how should we assess the broader risk of widespread use of these diet drugs? Are there potential unforeseen consequences? Is the market getting ahead of science? What do you think? Well, I definitely think the market could be getting ahead of science. We don't know what we don't know about this drug quite yet. So I did look at this actually, Dave, and in clinical trials, 73% of adults that took the highest dose of Agovi reported gastrointestinal issues, nausea, diarrhea, vomiting, constipation, stomach pain, et cetera. And some people reported you know, more serious side effects like pancreatitis and kidney failure. But, you know, nothing super out of ordinary, frankly, for drugs you hear about. I, there was, I don't know if you know, the famous author, Carly Yazid, but she basically said that she couldn't even move off the bathroom floor, was vomiting on the floor because she couldn't even raise her head to reach the toilet. So there are some people who had some really, really, really bad side effects, but that's that's all kind of par for the course, I think, for what this drug is doing. And I do think we... We don't know. We don't know yet. Yeah. Not adherence could be a real issue with all these side effects. Thanks, Julie. I'm not sure why insurers wouldn't cover them. Uh, insurers are just going to spread the additional cost around to everyone through higher premiums, and they'll pay out less money in medical claims to treat chronic conditions caused by obesity. To me, it's a no-brainer business-wise. It's like paying for smoking cessation classes. But what I do know is I didn't have to eat all those nachos. So there you have it. <laughs> now let's briefly talk about other big healthcare news that happened this week. Uh, Julie, what else happened that we should know about? Well, you know, a couple weeks ago, actually, the new CMS proposed rule came out that gave Medicare Advantage plans a 1% increase, CMS forecasted. But things are heating up because health plans are pushing back as their calculation is that the proposed rule actually decreases their payments by more than 2%. So we are starting to see, you know, some pretty heated loggerhead activity in the MA land. Yeah, they're coming after their money. That's not going to be yeah. pretty. Thanks, Julie. Dave, what other healthcare news this week is worth noting? Earlier this week, I had another moment where I felt like I was seeing technology change our world in real time. 
at the Intermountain Mindshare Conference, a logistics company named Zipline gave a presentation on its drone delivery system that it's pioneered in Africa to distribute medications and diagnostic specimens. Their continuous and automated system runs 365, 24-7 in all kinds of weather, delivering packages with paper parachutes into a space the equivalent of two parking spots with timing that is accurate within one minute intervals. I mean, just remarkable. Perhaps most remarkable of all is the aircraft carrier-like technology they use to pluck the flying drones going at full speed out of the air for restocking within two minutes and then being sent on their way again. Uh, So Zipline is an early stage company, but they've already made over half a million deliveries and they're now piloting their program in the U.S. with health systems like Intermountain. Even more unbelievably, they're launching a new program next month to deliver these packages into a target area the size of a dinner plate using tethered lines, again, within one minute of scheduled delivery. Imagine the potential time savings and convenience, particularly when paired with telemedicine services this new technology offers consumers. I mean, absolutely amazing. You know what I'm thinking, Dave? Are they strong enough to carry a deep dish pizza? Well, you know, food is medicine, Dave. Um, (laughs) Or a bucket of wings. Right. Let's see them do that. Let's see them deliver a deep dish pizza and a bucket of wings, and I'll invest. (laughs) (laughs) Or in jest. Or in jest. Very good. Very good. Thanks, Dave. And thank you, Julie. That is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to learn more about the topics we discussed on today's show, please visit our website at foresighthealth.com. And don't forget to tell a friend about the Foresight Health Roundup podcast. Subscribe now and don't miss another segment of the best 20 minutes in healthcare. Thanks for listening. I'm Dave Berta for Foresight Health.